Hello, Shadespire people, and welcome to the final installment of our look at the Magor's Fiends expansion for Warhammer Underworld's Shadespire. Uh, this time around, we're going to be getting our hot takes and first impressions on the factional ploys available for Magor's Fiends. Uh, now, in our previous videos in this series, taking a look at Magor's Fiends, uh, we saw that they are a very solid faction that is built mostly around this mechanic of being very aggressive uh, and forcing your opponent to respond to that, but also making it very dangerous uh, for them to do so. Uh, you want to be a brick that is right up in your opponent's face. Uh, and all of the objectives uh, and upgrades that we saw for Magor's Fiend seem to fit right into that model. But it'll be interesting to see if the ploys really reinforce that or if they make Magor's Fiends more versatile. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Alright, our first card is Blood Frenzy. Reaction, play this after an attack action or a ploy that takes a fighter out of action. Roll one extra attack dice for the first attack action in the next activation. Both hammers and daggers are successes for that attack action. Okay, so this is a reaction. Um, after an attack action or ploy that takes a fighter out of action. So, so far the verbiage would indicate that this can be you taking your opponent out of action or your opponent uh, taking you out of action. However, Roll one extra attack dice for the first attack in the next activation. Uh, so you're not going to want to do this when you manage to kill one of your opponent's fighters. You're going to use this when one of yours gets killed. The payoff for that is not only do you roll an extra attack die for the first attack action in the next activation, uh, both hammers and daggers are going to be successes. So uh, you're going to be going up, looking at the... Uh, previous stats for Magor's Fiends, you're going to be throwing three, possibly even four attack dice, and you're going to have on each die about a 66% chance of a success, which is really good. Um, the fact that it stipulates that it has to be the first attack action in the next activation uh, does prevent you from doing any sort of shenanigans. Uh, with an out-of-sequence attack, uh, the reaction from the Gorefist, any of that. This is strictly for you get one of your guys killed, you turn around and make your opponent pay for it. Um, now, normally I don't like uh, building strategy around losing one of my guys. I don't want to lose one of my guys, but it's going to happen, especially with uh, a very aggressive warband like this and one that seems to be built on this whole idea of wanting to take hits uh, and then punishing your opponent for them. So this goes right into line with that. Uh, my only concern beyond that is that their attacks are already pretty accurate. Um, you have a lot of uh, you know, a lot of three dice throwing uh, attacks in this faction. Um, it does occur to me that, uh, Riptooth specifically, uh, throws daggers for his attacks. So getting him access to hammers plus an extra die, uh, is really strong. Um, yeah, I would say that while I don't like building strategy around losing a guy, it's going to happen, especially in this faction. Um so you might as well make the best of it and again reinforce to your opponent that if he attacks your guys he's going to pay for it so not bad overall blood slit ground in the next activation enemy fighters have minus two move okay this is great the only bad thing i can say about this is that it only affects one activation but anything more would be overpowered um this uh, essentially falls into what I've been starting to call enemy manipulation uh, cards. This can uh, ruin a potential turn um, and a meta where a lot of people are going to accomplish their actual objectives 
on uh, activations three and four, this can completely ruin those plans, especially for factions that are naturally kind of slow. Or for faster factions in which you can tell that your opponent is really trying to leverage that extra speed uh, in order to accomplish their goals. The key to this and the key with every enemy manipulation card is that you've got to be paying attention to what your opponent is doing and you've got to make an accurate prediction of what they're going to do in the next turn. Uh, the upshot is that you prevent them from doing whatever it is, whatever it was they were going to do. They're going to have to make a sudden snap decision that they hadn't planned for. And hopefully that's going to create an opening that you can capitalize on. As far as these go, the, I think this is one of the better ones. Um, it would, you know, again, it can prevent somebody from getting onto an objective. It can pre prevent somebody from getting away from you. Um, in some factions, uh, for example, Sepulchral Guard or uh, Fire Slayers, it can straight up freeze them in place for a round. Great stuff. I really like it. Bloody Retribution. Reaction, play this after an attack action that takes a friendly fighter out of action. So okay, this time it specifies a friendly fighter adjacent to the attacker makes an attack action against that fighter. Okay. So this is an out of sequence attack, uh, which in a game with only 12 activations is going to be incredibly effective. This is what makes orcs really strong is having access to extra out of uh, out of order attacks and activations. Um, it specifies attack actions, uh, so this can be done uh, by a unit that has already charged. Um, if you've got this card, you're definitely going to want to keep your uh, your fighters in a close formation. Uh, such that if somebody attacks one of your fighters and they're going to be adjacent to one of your other fighters. The only downside I would say this has uh, is that a smart uh, player who's aware of the meta is going to know that this might be a possibility in your hand unless you've already played it and will probably try to position themselves to attack at the end of the line. Uh, where they are not adjacent to any of your fighters. Uh, in general, that's a good idea because it's going to um, prevent your opponent from getting the benefit of the support die. Excuse me. But all that being said, yeah, this is a very strong uh, card just by dint of being an out-of-activation attack. It's just going to be tricky to pull off. Uh, definitely a finesse card. Continue the slaughter. Reaction. Play this after an attack action or ploy that takes a fighter out of action. The first attack action in the next activation has plus one damage. Okay. Uh, again, this is going to be a reaction to you losing one of your fighters uh, because it uh, because of that next activation line unless you manage to find a way to pull off an attack uh, within uh, your enemy's previous turn let me see if that previous card would allow us to do that it can so I mean there's a combo right there it's a really interesting one where you can lose one of your guys uh, immediately attack as a response to that and then continue the slaughter uh, uh, going into your next turn assuming that your free attack that you got earlier is going to get you uh, a kill overall though I'd say that this is going to be a little bit tricky to use it's dependent on losing one of your guys, which is never a good thing. Um, and it's got that next activation uh, confusing this. Um, but all that being said, plus one damage is plus one damage. There's just a lot of easier ways to get plus one damage. 
uh, I'd give this card maybe a 5, 6 out of 10. Moving on. Demonic Resilience. The first friendly fighter who suffers any amount of damage in the next activation phase only suffers one damage. Okay, so anybody who's played uh, as Blood Reavers or against Blood Reavers does not need to be told how the how good this is. This is insensate, uh, but for Blood Warriors. Um, it's great. Um, it completely shuts down uh, one of your opponent's turns. If they're playing an aggressive deck, uh, it will force them to change around the order in which they do things uh, to prevent a big hit from coming in. Uh, I personally like to use uh, insensate, uh, and by extension, I like to use this card. Um, when I think that my opponent has spent a whole turn getting Fuel Grimnir ready for a charge. Um, and then when it gets to that final activation, he's ready to charge in. You drop this on him and then just watch all of their hopes and dreams die. Great card. Um, almost critical, I think, for most, uh, most decks. And, and for a larger, um, for a larger idea, keep in mind the strategy for Magor's Fiends is built around taking these hits, uh, reducing the negative impact of you taking those hits uh, is going to be really good. My only problem is this is going to convince your opponent not to attack you, and a lot of your abilities seem to be based around getting attacked. So there is that. That's just a small quibble. I still think that this is a great card. To put in just about any Magor's Fiends deck. Fountain of Gore. Reaction. Play this after an attack action or ploy that takes a fighter out of action. All friendly fighters have plus one defense in the next activation. Okay. Interesting. Um, so... Given that it can respond to an attack action or a ploy, this opens you up to chaining this off of things that will give you a little bit of extra damage. For example, Shard Gale, Trap, Shattering Terrain. Actually, Shattering Terrain would not work. Um, but uh, this is definitely going to be something that you pull on your turn after killing one of your opponent's uh, enemies. Go in, wreck somebody's day, Pot Fountain of Gore, and ha ha, you can't hit me back. Or at least it's going to be very difficult for you. Um, but again, uh, difficult to pull off efficiently. Because you're going to have to take a guess as to when you are going to be attacked. Uh, if you use this on a turn which in which your opponent was not planning on attacking you anyway, this isn't going to do you any good. Um, that being said, also a great, um, a great card to use if you're going to sit on objectives, if you're playing objective focused, uh, blood warriors, it's, it's okay. Um, it's on the high side of, okay. I, I'd say probably seven out of 10. Furious inspiration. Okay choose a friendly fighter they become inspired very very little ambiguity to this uh, it's real simple to pull off it is unique like all of these two Magor's fiends which is interesting I happen to know that there is a card um, we haven't gotten to it yet but there is a, a generic card uh, in the Farce Riders expansion um, that does this same thing so in this faction you can double up on those i find it interesting that you have that in the faction that probably has one of the easiest inspire mechanics uh, all you have to do is hit somebody uh, but that being said the advantage here would be that you get to pop that inspiration as early as possible in the game and Having an inspired fighter, especially as good as these inspired uh, stat lines are, having that inspired fighter on turn one is going to be a pretty sizable advantage. Uh, 
my question is, I mean, do Magor's Fiends really need this? They are already easy to inspire, and you are going to inspire by doing whatever you are planning on doing anyway. Uh, in any other deck, this would be a 10 out of 10. Um, for this, it loses a few points just because it feels a bit redundant. Um, now that being said, your mileage may vary. Having this uh, may give you a little bit more wiggle room uh, in terms of what you can do if you don't have to worry about getting all of your guys inspired as soon as possible. Glory to Corn. Roll one extra attack dice for the first attack action made by a friendly fighter in the next activation. Okay, super simple. Um, there is a Blood Reavers card exactly like this. It works just as well with them. Um, if I had anything bad to say about this, uh, it would be that, again, this is one that I'm not really sure is necessary in any other faction. It would be great. This faction is somewhat known for a lot of accuracy in their attacks. They're not often going to miss. Um, the one, the one, uh, exception to that, I would say is probably Riptooth, uh, who could definitely use the extra, uh, attack, or if you're trying to pull off any effect involving a crit, uh, going from two to three dice or three dice to four dice, uh, in hopes of getting a crit is going to help a lot. So yeah, this one, I would say situationally useful extremely useful in any other faction situationally useful in Magor's Fiends Horrifying Howl choose an enemy fighter that is adjacent to a friendly fighter and push them up to two hexes I do like movement shenanigans I like pushing things in general um, but I'm not sure that I necessarily, if I'm adjacent to something with one of Magor's Fiends, I don't want to be not adjacent to them. Um, now, yes, this could theoretically be used to push somebody around as opposed to away. Uh, so you could push them into a position where they are surrounded, um, which sounds great on paper, but in practice, it's actually kind of a corner case. Um, yes, you could use this to get somebody off of an objective and unlikely to jump back onto it, uh, since it's a whole two hex movement. Um, but then you could probably do that just by smacking them. And that's what Cor or Magor's Fiends is good at anyway. Again, this is another card that I would, I would give a nine or a 10 out of 10, uh, in any other faction. In Magor's Fiends, it just feels kind of extraneous. And I think this is our last one. To the victor, the spoils. Reaction. Play this after a friendly fighter's attack action. It takes an enemy fighter with a wounds characteristic of three or more out of action draw three power cards Ooh, okay there is not a lot of card draw in shade spire and this is a big pile of card draw this is three excuse me this is three power cards um which is more than just about any other card draw mechanic uh, save trust to luck and you don't have to do anything outside of what you're planning on doing which is killing people um, just about every faction has somebody with a one's characteristic of three or more uh, so you're never going to end up in a situation where it's impossible to use this uh, in a faction um, and again this is this synergizes right with what you were planning on doing anyway so I would, I would def, I would give this a nine out of ten, and definitely a ten out of ten if you are playing more than twenty cards in your power deck. Um, 
in fact, I would go so far as to say this is the best card uh, in this faction. Okay, so that's the last of them. Uh, so overall, um, we see that uh, Magor's Fiends started out uh, very strong with their characters, uh, their upgrades, and their objectives. Um, with their ploys, these tended more towards situational or extraneous. Uh, it's a pretty good problem to have in that you end up eliminating most of your factional uh, ploys because you don't really need them. Um, that seemed to be the major theme here. Uh, if you have them, they're either going to be extraneous or you're just going to uh, ensure uh, that an already strong stat works out for you. Uh, overall, I'd say this looks like a very strong uh, faction, uh, both for high-level competitive play uh, and also, uh, much like uh, orcs before them, uh, very good for a beginner faction. Anyway, I'm curious to see what your opinion is on this. Uh, please feel free to comment down below uh, about you know what you are getting from this particular expansion, whether or not you're excited to play as them or against them. Uh, or if you agree or disagree with any of my points here, keep in mind these are first impressions and hot takes, uh, so I'm sure that they will change over time. In the meantime, please like, share, and subscribe this video uh, to help us bring you more Warhammer Underworlds content. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I hope you have a great one.